Good afternoon, everyone. We are beginning our last round table for within this first virtual fair, uh, more rural, more digital uh, on the initiative of the uh, United Nations 1000 villages uh, initiative by the FAO organization. The first round table yesterday, we uh, dealt with the political transformation, the political aspects of the digital transformation in the digital world. What have been the progress, uh, what's uh, the progress uh, made? And we had also opportunity to discuss uh, family agriculture at the second round table. And we have also heard from a very interesting experience in China and, and India in e-commerce and that was round table three into right now we're starting round table four and we will be now looking at the approaches to accelerate this digitization in food systems and rural territories in latin america and the caribbean from the perspective of the private sector and the businesses and here we have representatives for international cooperation i am duclair is Sternart, and i am the youth Regional Alliances Officer for FAO Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Office. And we have four panelists today. I will be introducing them to you. The first one is Josephine Corelli from Minicorp. And we have Maria Camila Lopez from Juan Valdez and Teresita Di Marco. And we have I guess from the Spanish Agency for International Cooperation, and we are going to maintain the same order for their presentations, and each presentation will be 10 minutes long. And so whenever we're close to the end, two minutes before the end, I will be letting the presenters know that they're out of time and then we'll have some space for questions, answers, comments and and taking the, uh, the audience's questions and comments, of course. I think we're going to be uh, hearing from very interesting experiences that are very valuable for the theme of the, the fair. We're going to be hearing from our first uh, presenter, director of um, a, a mobile technology company in Luxembourg and and here it's called Tigo in our region. Josefina is Italian and she now lives in Panama and she is very committed to the creating connectivity for rural communities in our region and so Josephine you are most welcome and thank you for being with us this afternoon. Please tell us what Minicom is doing to uh, help us with connectivity. You have 10 minutes and I'll tell you when you're when you're two minutes left, when you have two minutes left. Uh, good morning and thank you everyone. I do, do thank you very much for your introduction. I'd like to congratulate the FAO and all its partners because really, frankly, this is very an, an, an interesting forum and it's very very current and it's absolutely important so Duclair has mentioned this uh, has explained what my company is about i am delighted this is a company very well known in central america we also are present in colombia bolivia and paraguay as tigo and so that's our our flag we are an operator of wide wide band mobile one wide band and we are uh, present in the mobile business and communication so we are at the very center of everything that has to do with what can we do through connectivity and digitalization to improve competitiveness and to do it do as much as possible and uh, build these uh, digital uh, digital roads and super highways right and provide provide connectivity to all in the rural areas 
there is something very important that we do that I, I and it's important to share it with you and be here at this fora to be able to share experiences. We have ESG and ESG very consolidated in terms of development and performance of our business based on the infrastructure. So even with the from the infrastructure that we have and we want to make this very useful, more accessible and more present for any group within any community. As you know, we are very dynamic, very demographically, very dynamic, but we are very small and we have a great presence of rural communities and areas. So for each one of us, uh, the territory is a very important element in deployment of uh, what uh, all of our technologies and our and so we have several projects that are dedicated to to the responsible and creative use of internet so that we in these uh, special social sectors are just for the first time ever being connected and being seen, they're being visible, and therefore this is part of our contribution. In other words, connectivity should not just should just not only be a desirable channel, but it should also be a channel of opportunity. So let me tell you about an initiative that we are carrying out in Colombia, and uh, our connected women in rural areas are carrying out something very interesting. And this is the project I want to mention to you now. So, for example, this program has a lot of uh, several components uh, connected women. We are talking about developing digital competencies, especially for women, Colombian women, and that's our focus, especially women who live and function in the rural areas of Colombia. And we expect these capacities and competencies and skills help will help them and we're based on in on a in in, in general environment that has to be positive and that will self be self regulatable and that will provide practical and efficient solutions in the for the everyday life but in reality here we have something important to say that we have to think about woman and its role and and her and the role of women and the and what she does right now women woman the woman is the head of the household really of the family nucleus and so uh, these are women who can also acquire tools for management of their own home and and also for the productive sector for instance in the village and so on so that being another home so we expect to offer products for them to improve their productivity and to and to reach better employment levels also and to manage to manage finances of course and and of course we're for them to be a reference in their own communities and women are also responsible for the the raising of the children and for uh, their they, they have to become aware of their own social responsibilities and within the family as well as well so these were all roles that were discussed and the relationship with connectivity and so what happens when you acquire digital capabilities and how these women can use them to enhance the roles and to impact positively the roles that they have to play in their societies. And so, so we have this program called uh, Connected Women, which uh, is also um, providing a platform that focuses on women who have no way because of budget or because of the uh, their location or whatever, that they have no idea that they could learn through connectivity and grow uh, with those skills. And another thing here is to strengthen the role of women as moderators and as mediators in their communities. And they, these women are also very exposed to what happens when they're exposed to connectivity, basically. So we created a program which has several pillars. And so, 
this was during the pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic have uh, been different in urban areas compared to the uh, rural areas. So we tried to uh, use and provide some a series of resources that could be adapted to the different realities. And so we're not going to get into any details here, but uh, but yes, we did have uh, some lectures and workshops and uh, during the uh, cycle, a uh, first cycle. And so the minute that the that we had these lectures face to face, then of course they are able to contribute active discussions on face on a face to face situation. Uh, and then the platform we will be visiting later, and it's a it's a very it's a web based app that we decided de we developed with one of our foundations. And so I'll, this uh, really, I would like to dwell on this a little bit. We began began in 2017 with GMSA. We we asked all of our the women in the different areas. We asked them what they were interested in. They said it, the and what they are interested in is financial management and using tools for management that a, a small business, for instance. And so this applies uh, to rural areas. And this was very interesting because that's what women asked for. And here we're going to mobilize a, a labor force that is very important and it's going to be making contributions to the economy. And therefore, we, with new dynamics of the agriculture and of the of the this sector in general that are being developed in this area. So this is going to be a double impact. And so we're thinking of the rural program for rural women. And after all of uh, when we had all these conversations, first of all, considering their roles, and then we thought about the, the, the mediator woman. What else can she do uh, and what? And so we got into the me conversations this is a program that is in place since 2020 and we still have to continue to develop it does have a series of uh, conversations about how women could actually be uh, mediating uh, and good mediators in the community in a creative manner and using creativity in a in a different way innovating maybe i'm only running already out of time uh, the use of internet at home, how to use, uh, how to help the children and how they can manage their their families and what opportunities they have. And of course, uh, everything has to do with the household. And this gives women capabilities for uh, them to be able to uh, be part of a responsible digitalization of the family. And when I mentioned the platform, we have had some issues that have been suggested that we should deal with social networks and personal finances and finances for for small businesses and also social networks for the family. So those are the four uh, items that are of interest. And uh, we also have uh, when we can provide some uh, financial find access to certain uh, credits or uh, we have some plans for rural women where they can it's a post payment plan where they rural women can actually um, participate and we offer them connectivity in in a way that is uh, easier faster for these women who are really uh, we have a special rate for them for the connectivity. It's a, it's a rural rate uh, for women who are uh, in, in at a different distance and they cannot have a connectivity for their own digital emancipation. So we have uh, some connectivity through this program. The 87,492 women have been connected since 2020 in the different departments of Colombia where we are active. And here you see the logos of the partners in this project. And we'll see where, uh, where we're headed towards. Uh, for sure, we are valuing all of the areas of their communities. And this is an instrument that we can offer, which is connectivity to all of these women who have been benefited. 
Thank you, Josephine, for your experience in particular with the ch challenges during the pandemic and that you carried out this initiative. Uh, finally, the, the need for virtuality during pandemic made everybody want to connect and uh, bridge gaps. And we have discovered the gaps and that the women in the rural areas have uh, been facing. So thank you for your project. And so we are now uh, get with Maria Camila Lopez. She's the manager for uh, sustainability manager for Juan Valdez Cafe. Many of you probably know Maria Camila Lopez is uh, in Colombia. This is a very famous outfit in Colombia, and she, her work is very interesting with um, family farmers and young family farmers. Maria Camila, thank you for being here with us today. Tell us a little bit about that experience. You also have 10 minutes and when you're when you have your two minutes to finish, we will uh, will tell you. Thank you very much, Duclair, for this invitation. I am here right now in Chile, and which is one of the our dearest countries and very close to our uh, company. And thank you to the regional FAO team for the invitation. I have to tell you what experience we have as a cooperate uh, cooperation uh, as a cooperative, not just because of the digital aspects, but also we want to mention the alliances and what how important they have been these partnerships to create and to succeed to have successful initiatives. Since we don't, you don't really know about the company, I will give you some details because I think it's something very interesting to show you the impact of our business. So we have a company that manages Juan Valdez brand, which is uh, owned by the Fondo Nacional Coffee National Fund, which is a parafiscal fund in Colombia that manages the investments that are done for over 550,000 family coffee families which are mostly small producers in the country. And this is very relevant because our company in the 94% does depend or the shares of the company come from our, our partners, which is the Association of Coffee Growers, which groups a number of families and looks for the well-being and the well, the wellness of these families. So we are now almost 20 years old and we have a very important purpose. It's not just selling coffee, premium Colombian coffee, which is, of course, is one of the great objectives that we have, but that's not the main one. Everything has to be ultimately benefiting our communities. So when we are talking about a business that is present at 510 shops in 20 countries, and we're present in three, thir over 30 countries and we now special shops. One of the models that has uh, taken us to uh, position ourselves is that purpose through the value chain. And I would like to tell you how we have been able to work on the digital ecosystem and how this has allowed us to generate a network through other allies. For example, we have been able to relate our beneficiaries uh, or relate to our beneficiaries through the digitalization process. And we have done it on two fronts. And let's look at this video, first of all. A Juan Valdez llega una nueva generación. Generación Juan Valdez. La generación de los que emprenden. Rompen estereotipos. Cultivan futuro, cultivan la tierra. Nuestra tierra. Le apuestan al país. Nuestro país. Reinventan lo existente. Esta generación está moviendo montañas, transformando el mundo. Es la generación Juan Valdez. This generation is transforming the world. Juan Valdez, el café de los Try jóvenes de todo el país. Young, the coffee for young entrepreneurs. So what you have just seen is the season that has that is just now finishing, coming to its end in Colombia, and it's it's going to be in Spain. So you can all 
try it because in the next few months you're going to see it in Chile. Also, this was a campaign. It's a video that was there for about two months. And what it does is it makes visible a work that we have been working on and doing since 2017 when we had this Renacer program, which tried to strengthen and vis make visible and revitalize the leadership of young uh, farmers who have been affected by exclusion in the past and who were were part of communities that were formerly inaccessible because of the wars and so many of them come from uh, are in territories that are that have excellent coffee quality and they're now becoming visible not only in Colombia but also in the rest of the world and so here we have in this program 120 young people in the country and these boys and girls that you saw on the screen are the people who are part of the program they're the true coffee growers young coffee growers who have worked for this wonderful coffee that consumers are enjoying at home and elsewhere and this is very relevant because these relationships are, of course, based on a commercial relationship. We have 120 young entrepreneurs, young coffee growers who have bet on this company, who have given us their premium coffee. And we have been, of course, uh, processed that in a premium manner. And we have bought about over 550,000 kilos of coffee. But I want to highlight and to be concrete about this, how we have grounded this initiative by approaching this as a digitalization, educating in digitalization. And we have, we see that get, thanks to that, these uh, people are no, are now arriving in a, they're doing other important things that they couldn't do before. Thanks to connectivity. Now they're no longer just trying to get to the cities, but they remain in their places and they have a great challenge because they don't feel connected. The young people don't feel connected to the territory. They don't feel that there are opportunities for them to to develop themselves in the rural areas. So they now want to they they don't think they can develop initiative uh, initiatives uh, that are innovative and uh, progressive and so right there our purpose we want we wanted to develop two types of products precisely thinking of them one focusing on micro lots and we we uh, did some traceability with the support of an organization that that is based in the US and and it's very interesting because uh, that way, the, the young people could learn this technology, they could become part, uh, empower themselves with it, and they could put that uh, tra tracker in the sacks, in the bags of coffee, and then we could trace the coffee once it went into the processing. Um, and so, uh, thanks to FAO again, we started with a project that, the, that we had and the FAO helped us and opened the way for us to be able to start a project with 60 young young coffee growers in four municipalities in one department that is currently the greatest uh, coffee producer in, in, in Colombia, which is the Huila coffee, which is very high quality coffee. And amongst uh, between men and women, we have approximately the same proportion between men and women in the territory that's 30 percent women 70 percent men and so through this project we're being able to strengthen the the program and the approach is cross-sectional in terms of digital alphabetization and so we are aware that we need to strengthen the digital skills to be able to enable other empowerments in other on other fronts and so with microsoft we have developed a digital alphabetization process which FAO is, FAO is familiar with, of course, in Latin America. And that has opened up some ways for the young people. Those who have very basic knowledge, then they can ac access these basic tools that for us are obvious, but for them, they're just the door the to put the foot in the in this digital world. And, and then there are some others that are more expert and that know a little more, more advanced. Two minutes. 
And so this is what allows us to in the with this diversity of knowledge and and not level ground, we can bring them all to another level of digitalization. And for instance, we are we're developing some projects with the Fundación Manuel Mejia, which is the educational arm uh, in Colombia. And with that foundation, we have already shared digital courses. We had offer, I've offered them workshops on um, entrepreneurship, productivity, different initiatives, creativity with a but on a digit in a digital manner. So we are dreaming that the, we can perhaps expand this program, not just in numbers of participants for more and more young people to be able to digitalize and participate and open up and amplify this model so that not just only for young people, but maybe their parents and their allies can also become part of this and that the young people will become the leaders for this expansion. And I'm closing. And this is one of the experiences that we have, thanks to the experience that we had with blockchain. Now we're doing some other, having other experiences with other in other territories. And just in closing, I can say that the coffee from the coffee growers, we have a great response. And from Juan Valdez, we have a great um, interest in helping to connect with all of them. Thank you very much, Maria Camille. Another very interesting experience from the private sector towards developing communities. And in this particular case, young coffee growers, which have also interest and may or, who are perhaps uh, more inclined to learning digital and uh, technological uh, the methods, but if they don't have any access, well, they cannot. So it's great for them to be skilled and learn skills and learn about tools that can actually be offered through their uh, digitalization. They can become better persons. They can become better leaders. And they can definitely develop their citizen skills also and develop their own communities. And so I'd like to remind you all that we are uh, we're live streaming this via YouTube, uh, via Zoom. So if you have comments or questions, of course, they're all welcome and you can share in the chats and we are systematizing everything and we will be sharing your questions and answers and we'll share them with the panelists. So let's hear from Teresita Di Marco. Teresita is, uh, comes from a company that is uh, working globally. I know that the company was founded in 2017 or 2018. She is in our region and she has offices in Argentina, Brazil and Chile. But Teresita is in Argentina, right? You're actually located, yes. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about the work she's doing in Guadalajara and for the development uh, of systems that will be promoting technology uh, for the agribusiness. And you have also 10 minutes, and I will warn you when you're almost up with your time. Thank you very much, Duclair, and thank you to the whole team that has invited us to share our experiences. For, for me, it is a very interesting experience to hear the experiences of other colleagues in uh, rural areas, especially to hear about the impact that you're having with rurality in the rurality. And I work for an, we have an NGO uh, that works on a global level and has five funds and we operate in the a certain in Asia Pacific and Europe, Latin America, United States. And it is now expanding to Africa. Our mission is to work to develop and promote agri-food tech sustainable ecosystems capable to promote agriculture and promote uh, human talent. For us, it's very important to understand the value 
uh, of Central America, Latin America and the Caribbean in terms within the global mega trends. We know that agriculture is about 5% of the region, the region's resources, and our region has about 36% of arable land and 33% of the resources of fresh water are in this part of the world. And so we also wonder what the role of family agriculture is in Latin America and in the Caribbean. It could, we could say that it is indisputable that family farming is absolutely indispensable. And we need to take into account the heterogeneity of Latin America, the fabric of Latin America. You can, we can say that their exploitations are 80% of their farming exploitations are generating a very important uh, employment sector. And so they have about 7%, 57 to 77% of employment. And so that means that this is very, very important. We work as consultants for ecosystems and we try to promote uh, offer and de supply and demand for our sector. And here we have a very important role. The demand for technology and the adoption of the right technology in this sector. And so And so th this map will allow us to understand this agri-food tech si ecosystems. And you'll see that those are in blue are more advanced and they're operating. And the ones that you see in yellow are the sustainable. And what we have a day to day is that we find a great difference in the southern cone that has developed technology and also the small producer of technology that is more advanced versus maybe other countries like in the Andean region and the Caribbean where the, the small producer still does not adopt technology in its totality or it's not familiar. The um, digital literacy is not there. So what happened this year with FAO they called us from the uh, innovation office in Chile, a dear colleague from, from us that sent us the challenge of what are the limiting factors or the options to adopt technology for the small producers. So we have been working in the challenge and now we wanted to share briefly some of the progress that we are looking based in the interviews and the information that we are gathering. And what we found is the challenge of the scarce access to energy and infrastructure in the rural community. And it's not less also the access to credit. Uh, the producers do not have access. And also there is a market with excess of intermediaries. And the value change in this case is makes the value, the small producer is left aside and the price that they receive is very low for the product that they are offering. And what is happening is that technologies are developing and they do not attend the specific needs of the small producers. And the cost to adopt technology is quite high without mentioning that the cultural barrier of the entrepreneurs and the producers is immense. And the producers in some countries, um, we have also uh, problems of languages. For example, in the Peruvian highlands that speak different languages and that are not able to connect with the entrepreneurs. So now, what are the opportunities that we can find? And that is very important. The technological adoption allowed some of the producers that were able to cross these barriers are now in a situation of uh, making the information more democratic so they can access markets 
selling their products at a better value, and this reduce um, the price arbitrage, and this it helps the fintech for the agriculture apps that allow them not to have intermediary so the small producers can have access to credit. And also this closes the gap between the producer and the consumer. And they are also uniting with local producers. And this situation makes them apply better uh, sustainable practices for their own agriculture. There are many the challenges and the opportunities but some of conclusions that we have had from this study is the need to have a stronger offer in technology. And so how can we do this? How can we increase the offer of technology to create connection spaces connected with the reality of the small entrepreneurs? And this is where innovation has an important role in the area of connection among both parts. It's also important to see uh, create the visibility of the startups that are looking for technology that many of them die before they cannot interact. And of course, to work from the environment to enable this type of uh, needs. And finally, to close, we wanted to let you know how to strengthen the demand of technology. It's very important, and we have been studying that there is an educational gap, not only a cultural gap, but also an educational gap uh, regarding the producers. And it's important to train the uh, farmers so they can adopt practices that can give them better benefits, to promote digital literacy and to accompany them. They need the accompany to adopt technology. And most often we have lost the connection with the reality of the rural sector. And they need this accompaniment to adopt technology, to provide um, fiscal benefits or other types of incentives that favor so the small producers can see a win-win. And finally, we cannot leave aside how we need to improve the connectivity and infrastructure so technology can reach these places. So this is a very short summary of what we have done with FAO, that truly it's a privilege to be here in the sector. For us, that we are an NGO that works directly hand in hand with the private sector, and the entrepreneurs, it's very important to understand the needs of the producers and this is why we are doing the study. So this is what we wanted to present you this uh, progress. Thank you, Teresita. Just in time, when do you think this uh, publication will be ready? In December, we have to uh, give the results. So this depends on the innovation office of FAO, but the idea is to generate, to participate in uh, panels and to show the studies and the data because it's very important for the development of the small producers. Thank you. Of course, everything that is related with challenges and opportunities is very important and I'm sure it will be uh, have a better detail in the study. Both uh, Medicom and Juan Valdez have felt in the two experiences that they have presented to us. So thank you very much for the compliment. And now we will go ahead with Miguel Angel. He is experts of the uh, Spanish Corporation for the Development. He works with public-private alliances, and he will share his vision and the role in the digitalization of the rural world based on the Mexican experience. Miguel Angel, thank you very much for being here with us. You have 10 minutes, and when two minutes are remaining, I will let you know. And thank you very much, Tuca and FAO, for this invitation, for having me in this virtual fair 
in this important initiative uh, of a thousand digital ideas for Latin America and the Caribbean. Duca mentioned in her presentation in the last years uh, that is linked to the um, Spanish Cooperation Agency, especially in Mexico, we have launched a very intense work with the confirmation of public-private uh, alliances for the development in other areas uh, that we had logically with uh, the development of the 2030 Agenda and the seven objectives, especially the seven objective 17. But the logic that gather us together today, I would like to say, uh, because this is what we what ha happened, uh, and maybe this is the first part is a bit theoretical, because then of the three uh, fantastic interventions, now I have a, a small desertion, but I think it's necessary to try to understand of what we are talking about, what is really the background, the context, what surrounds this phenomena that is absolutely necessary. It, which is to work strongly and with a clear vision towards digitalization of the food system. So the first question that I ask myself, what is it? What are we talking about when we speak about digitalization? Because I wanted to know what was necessary. It was important to have an update about what we're speaking to answer to the second and th a third question, how? which gathers us today, how we should move forward, how we can accelerate the process from different stakeholders, especially from the private initiative. And here I'm giving you some hints with whom. So to try to answer the first question, you will forgive me, I would like to bring the definition from the European Union, which is important, of what they call uh, smart villages. In this definition that you are going to see that there are different colors, basically, so we can trace, uh, have a clear trace of where we have to move, we have several things, which are what happens in the rural communities that we want them to be smart villages. Why do we use those uh, innovative solutions that we need to uh, take advantage? We need to take advantage of the for, uh, strengths and opportunities. And we need to base in uh, this exercise in a participative approach. And uh, I, someone had asked, it's logic to know what is happening, what uh, the main characters will say, what are we looking at the end to improve those economic, social, and environmental conditions, including in the yellow color, digital technologies? In the third part of the smart villages, it says that they are based in cooperation and alliances. And I would like to center a little bit more, and it's maybe we have had more experience, especially in Mexico. But this definition also tells us where we should go. And the three uh, presentations that we have had are here in existing initiatives. And we need a strategy of digitalization in a broader framework to promote development and the existing initiatives, the good practices of the companies or authorities and some organizations of the civil society, of the academia or the cooperation agencies are spaces where we can start to accelerate this digitalization process, to accelerate the transformation process for the development. And in the last part that I, I do agree, but it's a bit limiting, all this exercise can have the public and private financing, and I'll speak about this. It's not really financing, it's resources. 
with resources we can incentivate. In some cases and in some rural communities, it has shown that the less important is the financial resources. What is more important are the relationships and it's necessary the knowledge. But let's not uh, go forward. The second point that I wanted to mention when we speak about smart villages, what means smart? And I'm not kidding. I think it's important. Why a village is, is intelligent? And here in this presentation that uh, FAO can have it and you can receive it with the reference what are we speaking when we speak about technologies that we are going to apply so an idea, an idea uh, a town would advance? Well, these technologies, these digital technologies should be used when they are appropriate and necessary. We should know the territory. We should know what is happening. What are the challenges uh, that affect that uh, rural territory? It's not a, an end, it's a mean, and it's a very important tool, but it's not the objective. We should not get mistaken. We should not uh, confuse uh, means and objectives. The locals are the one that should take the initiatives. Of course, this is very necessary. We should not forget. And when we have to design a strategy or initiatives or to adapt them that have been successful in an area, we should count with the local stake stakeholders. We cannot think that any successful initiative in an area independently or uh, of the context is going to be also successful in another place. It should not be so. And again, we see the need to create alliances and ways to cooperate. So with these two images, I wanted to create an idea of what we are talking when we speak about digitalization when we speak about digitalization in the rural area. And I, there, I have been able to answer or dare to answer, knowing the what, we can know the how. So this is the guiding question, how we could accelerate all this process of digitalization. And analyzing the two definitions that I previously placed, I would like to mention three working spaces. One which is quite broad and strategic, as you can see in the first bullet, which is the design, this exercise to design and identify and implement and a strategy of digitalization. We have to be very clear what the roadmap are we follow in a concrete territory. I repeat, we need to find the correct uh, road for the development through including technology, digitalization, transformation processes to, allow, uh, to focus in the development of that community. You can see that I have colored the same colors. So the ones they can see the color coded, where we have the general strategy and applying a tool that is a strong, like digitalization. I define again the framework um, that are appropriate and the local stakeholders should have that program. The other two items that you see, the, the other two bullets, I have placed them at the same uh, height, but maybe they should be a little bit lower because it answers to the how. How should we advance to identify the planning and the starting up, building alliances and creating cooperation or multiplying the cooperation ways that we have? And of course, I have said before, having exist, existing initiatives. So we have the how, we need to have all the stakeholders involved, and we need, I would say, if necessary, with existing initiatives, we should uh, adopt what we have. I think these three items are basic to advance in a digitalization process, which is intelligent also. Please excuse me if I'm redundant, because in it's in intelligent digital transformation. And as Tuka said at the beginning, 
uh, maybe what we have developed with greater strength and more impetus in Mexico in the last years is the generation of multi-actor alliances for the development. For us, it has been the public-private alliances. As the name says, uh, multi-actor alliances are spaces of work and relationship where we have all the stakeholders that have something to say or to contribute in this process. We have the governments, the, the civil society, the private sector, it's the university, the academia. Everyone that has something to contribute should be part of the space that we call, we can call like multi-stakeholders alliances. The references of this exercise uh, is uh, the SDG 17. Now that we have the objective, the alliance is not a space of a dialogue, just only to get to know each other. Uh, two more minutes. It's a space where the impact and the development is that element. Here, I will just say it quickly, to mention the experience, the multi-stakeholders alliances. We can have more, but this is stakeholders and capacities and resources, and there are expect expectations of this work. In the left part, you can see the private sector, and we have in red the word trust. This is the important field that we need to use, so the private sector would like to involve in developing processes that are part of all these other stakeholders at the right, through which, through social responsibility, these strategies, being a responsible business, you can see they are linked. And the incentive, trust and incentives. What is the incentive that a company can have to be part and that is accelerating the digital processes, a benefit for the business, a benefit for a company, they should always find an incentive in what they are doing. I would not want to deepen here. We can work more if we could, we can speak other elements and how we have generated. And we are one of the trust reference in Mexico. Uh, I can share information about this and we can have other spaces. And finally, the existing initiative since 2017 in the state of Michoacán, here you will see these images with a lot of text, but we speak precisely about the inclusion of digital resources. So women that are chefs, are cooks, uh, that have been vulner vulnerable, uh, have been object of violence by organized groups because they are uh, women that are alone. They have created uh, these working spaces, small innovations that are being recognized and that are recognized internationally. And a last image, you see uh, the logos, the images of the stakeholders that have been part of this initiative that has strengthened a working space linked to food, to the consumption of products that in some cases were forgotten through a traditional cooking and in a framework of a, the development of a touristic development that has an important touristic uh, attractive. And there you see the uh, railroad station and a Spanish station that has the know-how about the work with these women. So, Duca, I will leave it here. Thank you very much. Very complimentary, this for a presentation. I like the part that Miguel said about the mobilization of other stakeholders for the same goal for a same objective within the territory in the case of digitalization and especially the financing to have resources and having resources, not only financial, but other types of commitment that can have also important results. So we have some questions now and we still have 20 minutes, which this is uh, good because we can specify the different uh, interests of the audience. I separated three questions of the many that we have received, and each one can answer 
but I understood that the question has a profile. So I will try to focus the question to one of the presenters, to one of the panelists. But if someone else would like to comment uh, or to add an, an answer, for example, for Josefina, I would say that it's a very good question for her, which is linked to the digitalization in the rural world, more um, linked to the access and connectivity. So the question is, what possibilities are there that a private company or public brings satellite internet to the rural sections and aboriginal sections that are completely away from the digitalization. I, I will go on with the other questions. There is a question that maybe would be for Maria Camila and Teresita. If the, stud, the study level in education, the education of people, it's a barrier for digitalization of small producers. The digital literacy could be uh, also uh, an activity to have literacy in the digital world and in the both worlds. And now let's go back to Josefina Miguel. What are the three or four key elements to accelerate the adoption of technology in rural areas from the, sec the private and public sector that can be considered in a strategy of rural digitalization? So these are the questions that I was able to rescue so, Josefina, in three minutes, if you can answer the question. Thank you, Duca. I think uh, it's a good question. I have my doubts that I can answer in three minutes, but it's a reflection that I see what it reflects. And this is the type of technology. And Miguel Angel already said it. Personally, I do not think it's the type of technology. We, in the real world, Teresita is studying with the amazing data they are gathering. We do not need new technologies, or I really don't think. We have many offers right now. But I think that the question that we should ask ourselves in this environment, in the digital ecosystem that is made by the public, the private, and the academia, what is the return? Why? Uh, to the certain type of technology can reach more groups. So what is the objective? And as an operator, I think there are several elements that are very important. The first, and re let's remember the techno phase, it's always the deployment of infrastructure of any kind, even the basic transportation. And this is something that should not belong to a stakeholder, not only to transportation or energy. This is a joint effort and we have to create the environment. And I'm speaking right now, and I shared a figure in the case of telecommunications, uh, the CapEx and the 80% of the investment is done by the operator. So what type of regulatory environment in, for example, in the rural sector, the times needed, the times that are needed, for example, to have a maintenance of a network in the metropolitan area should not be the same as the ones that you apply to a rural area. And this is a very simple example. Maintenance cannot happen at the same times or the same speediness. 
so the public policy first and the regulation should uh, fulfill the expectations of the return of energy. And I think we live in a stage that is quite dynamic technologically. We are in the fourth, fifth, almost sixth uh, industrial revolution. But now it's time that we can find a way that this can reach the communities. And the mean should be a public policy that really has an ecosystem for investment in the long run. Because in my experience, and uh, my company has been 30 years in the region, and basically we have doubled investments because really what we want is a deployment of infrastructure of quality because we need it to remain, that this is not a seasonal project. And we have enjoyed so far and we are in multi-sectorial, which is another important element. So the question really is not the environment. And obviously the question here is the origin. And there is an immense discourse about the differences that we need to respect of how, how we, this type of change can impact of uh, the quality of life, of contact, is a big change. We have to realize this because there are communities that are not so exposed like other ones to digitalization. So there, of course, there are possibilities that, yes, there are, but we have to move with multiple tools. I insist regulation, investment, security of the environment, and the proactive part of the private sector so the community can be involved in, in any area and digitalization. Thank you very much, Josefina. So now I'm going to give the floor to Camila and Teresita if they will have any comments. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. I will start if you want. Yes, what we have seen is that Undoubtedly, there is a huge challenge in terms of the general education in the countryside. And the, you know, let's say that even the fact that they have already can read and write, that's already something that has evolved in the in general in the world. So now we have more communities that have gone through at least primary education, but there is a lot of discrepancies from one in one same territory in from there are differences in between one community and the other even between boys and girls or different groups of young people so they could you could have a diversity of levels in other words it's not homogeneous at all you could have some that have professional studies others that are who barely have gone through primary school others that are very productive in terms of skills and their projects and so on but what we have transformed ourselves is the um, because we have another uh, project with another NGO, which is Coffee Women, and we work only for only with women, 100% women. And so we started, we initiated uh, our activities with the financial education activities. And so we realized that women were not really uh, using the program that we had prepared for them and generated for them. They weren't enjoying that. That program we had generated with other associations, with banks and so on so that the women were not ready to receive all that information about financial uh, skills because they didn't even have the basic skills to even use the mobile phone or their computers. And I'm not sure if this relates directly to the question, but what we did understand is that the digitalization has an alphabetization process as the very basic thing to have for then building on that. And that's the reason why we had to reorganize the modules of education that we have and, and within all different projects that we have, where we have beneficiaries of this sort. And so in this case, for instance, we have a local uh, community tourism where we saw the same thing as with the financial courses. Women had to use WhatsApp, for instance, which is a more simple uh, way of uh, providing a course. Uh, even so, that was very, they have very basic knowledge. They, they, the fact that they don't really have a great connectivity, they wouldn't be able to, they didn't know really how to use the tools. And those are things of the territory. And so we realized that we needed to go through these processes of 
alphabetization. And then, of course, if we can extrapolate the same situation to other situations and and so we could not really capitalize on their potential to be more productive. Thank you very much, Camila. I totally coincide with what you've just mentioned. I am so in agreement because I think in order to answer this question, I think we need to understand what the objective is. Number one, one of the project objectives of education or the educational system, one of those is uh, the key ones is to provide tools for people can actually be independent on their own. They can develop themselves and introduce themselves into society a self a help kind of situation. And this is uh, this means that many times the tools that we have to grant through the to provide through the educational system, those tools need to be a, a, this should be uh, in accordance with the times that we're living. So the digital education is part of the technical, the tools that people need to have and that producers and societies in general need to have and manage everywhere, not just in cities but, or in, in the countryside, but also everywhere for the people can to be able to develop their own talents and their competencies because the tools are tools and they need to be provided the appropriate ones that are that are uh, proportionate to the commensurate to the times that we're living and so now this is being observed and that's the reason why now we see many government programs that are focusing on education on information technology so very focused on that for a certain region and for instance that's the reason why in my country we are seeing how this is being implemented and the progress that is being made uh, through the knowledge of the ITs and the interaction that they can have through the IT. So digital alphabetization is also very important. We call that literacy also, right? Uh, digital literacy is the key. And so the interaction is important, but how can you interact if you don't know the technologies? And this is what international organizations need to do Come jointly. Education has to be assessed and 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 it should be managed and provided jointly by all the different players. And that will be successful. That's why this total literacy is a fundamental tool for the development of all societies and groups and communities. And in the future, for instance, in the cities, you have an advantage and in the places where this is not present, we need to support it. We need to jointly provide it and, and support that. Thank you very much. And then again, Miguel Angel, the last question is for you. Uh, okay, yes, uh, Duclair. I, yes, I was hearing the some elements that would be key for the adoption of the digitalization and taking into account the private sector. Of course, I think that we have been given some very key uh, keys, fundamental keys to know where we should begin to, to st where we should start, where we should begin to look even, and maybe I'm repeating myself and maybe what others have already said. Of course, knowing the territory, knowing the environment, that's key because and we have to be very honest, not to see whether or not the response that I have, uh, the answer that I have is the one that really matches them. No, I really, really should know what's going on really. And then I can design the responses that I can provide, the, re the answers that I have. And so designing those answers is the important thing. And it, they, those answers need, in order for the answers to be efficient, effective, we, they need to be provided by the ones who really have the skills and the capacities. We're talking about five players, public sector, leadership it, from the public sector, they generate the conditions and that's their obligation, right? That's their mandate as a public player. The private sector has a lot of technical capabilities, a capability of action. The private sector knows very well how to resolve problems. We have academia, we have the international players. Uh, for development, and there's we, there we see the United Nations, for example. We have all these agencies, and we need. We also have the organize the civil society organizations, and these players, this group of players, must. Uh, once we have identified the challenges and the that we have for development, we should see the best answers and the best offers and how those need to be implemented. And so, knowledge and appliance of applications that 
come up not from an office, not from a desk, not from a a logic that is just theory or theoretical uh, knowledge. We as an agency would for several years now in Mexico, we realized as an agency, we realized that many companies, businesses knew the territory a lot more than the many of the cooperation agencies. They were right in there, established in those territories, and they were much more granular in their relationships, and they knew what was going on in those territories. And so, therefore, we cannot uh, disdain the capacities of knowledge and uh, response capabilities of some of these players who are in each one of those that are in, in, in one of any one of those five categories that I've mentioned. And to finally, I would like to mention two very basic elements for an exercise where we want an effective and efficient answer to we and to accelerate digital transformation in the private sector. We need to have offer trust and incentives. We have tried and fought for five years to uh, to bring down certain stereotypes and realities that have uh, arisen from the understanding of of the companies, the business uh, towards the uh, private, the se public sector, and vice versa. We have mistrust, misunderstandings. What did we do? We have made huge processes of dialogue to be able to generate a trust, a trusting relationship. And once we have achieved that, then we can really work together and we can understand the different expectations that each one of the players does have, those that are going to be working on the territory. And so the capacities that we have, the capabilities that we have, that we are able to and willing to provide and share and co and contribute and this we need a facilitator that's the government for all they are the ones who make policies and we are not to uh, supplant or replace the public sector and the same thing as the public agency cannot actually replace a business a private sector business or anything or we need to know who we are what we have what we can do work together stay in our place not trespass over anybody else's and we need to this is not a magical formula but this is a formula that should be working if we put in put all those ingredients into place well thank you very very much and yeah miguel and i think we have uh, reached the end of this uh, uh, meeting it this last block of questions has been quite interesting and 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 it already opens the door to thinking about alliances and partnerships for us to really be able to develop the countryside, the rural areas, improve digitalization, close gaps, not with one player, not only one player has the, the answers and not just one person can uh, overcome the challenges. And here we need to realize that more than one actor needs to in, be involved in the strategies of inclusion and, and rural inclusion and rural digitalization because this is uh, was even more uh, developed during the pandemic and has now become an important aspect an important player in society and productivity and for the ur urban world and for the rural world but unfortunately we need to know exactly that that know that the pandemic increased and and exacerbated certain things and we need to work in a more assertive way and we need more one more than one player and here we're talking about civil societies academia and private sectors and governments mainly governments they are the ones uh, that are marking the 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 field the gov local governments national governments regional governments local communities and also international cooperation agencies and the UN agencies, of course, for with which we're working today and we're exchanging experiences and knowledge. So I think uh, thank you very, very much for your uh, participation. And here uh, we have only one uh, male here participant here today, but so blessed amongst women. And so uh, thank you for your participation. I just need to inform that we had 1,534 persons participating during these two days of the fair through YouTube, Twitter, uh, the FAO accounts, 
and almost 450 people who uh, registered on our platform, on the FAIR platform. And I also would like to thank everyone who have uh, contributed to the uh, stands of the fair and to create experiences, uh, virtual experiences for our visitors and also all the workshops offered and our colleagues here at the FAO. And to close this day, I must inform that this platform will be, with all the material of the fair, will be available for the next six months. So those of you can access all of the information provided and you can enjoy every single space of the website and the platform and we have enriched it and filled it with interesting material throughout in these two days so welcome again welcome to digital villages and thank you for your participation and thank you once again a thousand thanks a million thanks for everything <laughs>